So today's class, the second of three, we're going to deal with all the things that have to do with koshering your house. Most of what I wrote here is about koshering your kitchen, but it is not exclusive. There are some stuff on the back that deals with a bit other things, but 90% of the time we're going to be spending in the kitchen, the eating areas, the dining room, and so forth. So, so, so there is a general rule. A general rule when it comes to koshering for Pesach, koshering your items, is really the intent is that you shouldn't be koshering things. Really. Hello, Leslie, this is Mommy calling. F Can you please, uh, uh, I'm in a meeting right now. <laughs> okay. See you soon. Bye-bye. I was just calling Wesley to tell him I was there. So the, um, the, the basis is really we're not supposed to kosher anything. You're allowed to. And the world has become accustomed to doing so, especially a previous generation, like my parents' generation. It was very common. I mean, we would kosher everything. My house was like crazy. My mother had like stuff that she she set up for Pesach. We never we never used. Like I mean, there was, you know, like to make latkes on Pesach. Who knows what she'd want to do? Like all kinds of things. Um, but because it's become a customary that people do kosher things. So we, every year, we want to teach people how to do it correctly, because you're allowed to do it. It's not forbidden from doing it. It is that one shouldn't do it if you don't have to. And it's something that uh, uh, one day to achieve a goal where you don't really have to kosher your utensils and your, your the stuff you cook with. Rather, of course, you'll have to kosher your kitchen. You're not going to eat uh, you know, matzah a whole year. But I'm talking about your other objects. Nevertheless, we're going to learn how to do it because it is known that everybody does it, and they do a lot of things, and, um, and we've got lots of different ways to accomplishing it. So why don't we start here with, and you can feel free to ask questions throughout that, per, that pertain to what we're doing. So first, we're going to talk about appliances. So the appliances, of course, all, all need to be koshered. And they need to be uh, koshered because we use them to prepare food. So they're certainly going to have food in them. And, uh, and therefore, we have to develop a way in our process in, in, uh, so that all of that food is gone. Now, some of the objects that you're going to have, mostly the handheld utensils, are going to be almost impossible to do. Because not that you can't kosher them, you can take them the pieces and kosher it. But very often you will find that if you would take apart um, a hand a hand blender, for instance, uh, you're going to find flour inside of it. Because it, uh, you know, when you're working, the flour and things pop, pop, puff up, and it goes inside of the machine. Normally we don't care. What's the difference, little flour inside your machine? It's, uh, you know, it's not going to do anything. But for Pesach, the problem is that it also can come out of the machine. The way it went in, it can come out. So some of those uh, machine, uh, those handheld machines, you can't really go sure. Would you like a, a sheet? We have um, just so you can follow along if you'd like. You. Sure. You, well, uh, there's some for everybody. Okay. So um, on the basis of that, we're going to first talk about your sort of heavy appliances, and then we'll get into some of the smaller ones. The first thing that is, I'll start with the more controversial, which is the stove tops. Mm -hmm. So the plain stove tops that were very common in our homes for most of our lives, which are either gas or electric, they're relatively simple. Um, the, most of the stoves right, today are, that we've had throughout our lives were ceramic covered stainless steel. And therefore, the stove top itself, the actual, not the burners or where you cook, but the top itself, you can't really do anything with for Pesach because it's ceramic and it can't really be koshered. Um, so one would have to use hot plates or put aluminum foil over it or some other type of object so you're not, so, so that you don't put anything in direct contact. And you, of course, have to be very careful not to take hot pots that you would actually put on there um, because you know, you're going to transfer from the uh, stovetop, the part that we are not using normally, into your pot by doing that. But, but the actual area that you cook, so you have in the older ones, right, the ones that most of us grew up with, be, be it gas or electric, you have the actual burners. Like let's say you have four, four burners. Four coils. Yeah, coils or burners, depending if it's gas or electric. So in those cases, to actually kosher the coil in electric, you simply have to make sure it doesn't. there's nothing on it. There shouldn't be because of how they work. And you just have to turn them on to the highest possible heat it can go for just a number of minutes, 10 minutes. The idea is, is that the amount of heat 
that it uses to absorb chametz is the same amount of heat it uses to give off the chametz. So what you're going to do is you're going to kosher it simply by turning it up to the highest possible heat it'll go, and that will take it out. Then after that's done and cooled, you would then wipe it down. Now you should wait 24 hours from the time you've used the burners for chametz to the time that you actually kosher them. You should do that. If you don't, it's still allowed, but it's it is it is a serious difference, and you really should wait 24 hours um, before you do that. Now, all of them have drip pans underneath them. Those drip pans, at, at the it's really best to replace them. They're not very expensive. You can go to Canadian Tire and pick them up. Um, if for some reason you can't replace them, there maybe they're unique or, or, or you know, it's uh, it's not my place to tell you how to spend your money. So you could um, again clean them, clean them very well, and cover them with aluminum foil, because here the problem is is that. The, um, the heat, when you're cooking, will cause those things also to heat up, and the food, the, right, the garbage food that's, that's dripped into that is going, to, is going to send off fumes into your food. And then you basically have comets in your food. So you want to get rid of anything that's on there, and it's preferable really to replace them. You really should replace them. Can you still yes. clean them as you do your oven? Yeah, you can, as long as they're um, of the right material, depending on the ones you have. If they're heavy enough me uh, metal, you can self-clean them. If they're not heavy enough, they'll melt. Yeah, no, so be careful, it'll ruin your oven. <laughs> yes. For um, uh, gas stoves, do you have to like put anything underneath the Well, under the burners of the gas stoves, you also have drip pans. Ah. So you have to do the same thing with those, right? Because it's going to have food in them. So they have to be cleaned in any case. And then, you, um, then, uh, and then you'd have to cover it with something, but it's really preferable to replace them. You could replace all four for less than $40, probably less than $30. You, just, they, you go into the store, um, into Canadian Tire, they have them hanging on racks. They're, they're really inexpensive. Um, the burners themselves, I explained, the stovetop you really can't kosher. So what you do is you, can, you cover it with aluminum foil if you want, or if you don't want to cover it all, you don't have to. Just you have to be strict not to put anything down on it, right, on the stovetop because it's not, it hasn't been koshered. So you could put hot plates down on it and then put something on it, but you have to make sure that if you put a pot on the stovetop, you have to presume that that's, that pot has now become chametz and you can't use it, right? So do you have to be careful with that. Do you have to put oil on the cooktop before you put the, what did you call the? The drip pans? No, hot I have a, the hot plate, yeah. Oh, like the? Do you, or you mean if you yeah, would I bought a double top plate okay. for myself. So I don't have to put anything down on top of the cooktop or should I put two bowls? If you're going to well, the if you're on the cooktop of the hot plate? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to get to that one. Oh, okay. If for some reason we don't see me afterwards, and I'll go over it with you because uh, that will come up quite a bit. The stove itself, which say a self cleaning oven, which is what we're That's an oven. We're just dealing with the stove. But the metal, right? So you have to cover the metal. The metal of what? Of the stove. I mean, like the, where you have you have a record. We'll, we'll get to the stove, oh. uh, the oh. oven, but the stove top. top. Stove What's top. there to cover? Just the the, the metal what, around. So when you're cooking, you take the pot off the burner and you put it on on the stove. Yeah, that's the stove top. I said you you can't put anything on the stove top because oh. in the older ones they're ceramic. All right, they are ceramic. A ceramic can't not be koshered. So right, you have sheet metal covered with ceramic. That's why they chip, because it's ceramic. Now, the newer ones have flat tops, right? These are flat top cooker, cooking uh, diet. It's very common now. Probably the majority of people have them, right? While it wasn't that way five years ago, today pretty much everyone has a Pyrex one, or one or another. In general, there's an argument about koshering them. Um, but I've always been taught and have and, and followed the idea that, again, you should wait 24 hours before you, after you've used it. And then you can turn on the burners, right, the same way you did if you were turning on the burners otherwise. Those burners will, um, will heat up and they'll kosher the areas where the burner is so that those areas are, would be fine to use. The rest of the area, right, the problem is like this. If you would kosher that, the way you would kosher it is with boiling hot water. However, it is highly probable that if you do that, you'll crack it because it's not made for that and the hot water going onto the onto that glass or pyrex will cause it could cause it to uh, start to shatter mm -hmm. so 
if you did it and it didn't shatter, you can use it. But I'm not advising you to do it. Mm -hmm. And what you would do then is that any of those areas, you should, you can't really cover them because it'll um, it'll affect the burners. So you have to just be extremely strict and not to put things down on those other areas of the stovetop. Um, right? And of course, this is after you've already cleaned it. Right, totally and wait 24 hours then you kosher the four burners or the six burners whatever you have and those areas become fine the, the areas that do not heat at all those areas are just like on the old stoves that you really can't use okay and the back where the knobs are you don't have, except for cleaning them yeah and, and and often you have to take the knobs off if you can if it's that difficult because food will get underneath them okay um is that if you have a splash thing on the back so it's many people will cover it because if you splash and then it splashes back you're splashing back stuff that was on it before but it's not necessary really it's just a good idea if you want but you have to be careful if there's a socket for a light because if you have the aluminum and you try and put a yeah, gel in right you have a problem you don't want to <laughs> aluminum foil is not always good no. right you have to you might have to others if you had a question yeah, i have a question um i i have a, a gas stove uh, a gas top um and it's those very heavy metal burner right. uh, right. things that. Uh, so those kinds, you, I would, you would have put I those. Can I put that in the oven? I, I would say that I haven't seen them. Halakhically, you can. Okay. Uh, I would believe that if you're, that what you're describing is something that's heavy enough that it will not melt. Yeah, I don't. I doubt it. But I doubt it either because it's probably it's heavier metal. than the than the inside of the oven, okay. right? Which won't melt. Read yeah. Manual. All right. So, so that's your your stove top. Now, in that uh, now your oven. Your oven and your stove are very different according to Jewish law, so in many ways. So in, in the area of the oven, the oven heats up much higher and has a closed environment, so the halachas are a little stricter. In the case of an oven, what one needs to do, first thing is the, the, the perfect thing is that you wait 24 hours after using it and then you should put it on self-clean. If you have self-cleaning, you've made your life a lot easier because you just have to self-clean it. If you put an um, the racks and you put in other things like from the stove as we mentioned before those things will become kosher because you've made them hotter than they're ever going to get and they ever were and therefore they become totally kosher and parv yes I know that the grid on our on our um, oven it's a gas stove um, it says the instructions say not to put the grid inside the oven okay then don't it. then don't it'll warp it'll change color I think that's for discoloring though. discoloring yeah. It'll discolor. That's so your, 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 right now they're a nice silver. Okay. It'll discolor to a bluish. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. But how else would you clean them if you can't clean them in a self-clean oven? How else would you spray oh, cleaner? Yeah, you have to clean it like you're cleaning a stove, like an oven. Spray clean. Yeah. Spray clean. Easy oven. Okay, so, yes. Just a quick question. And if it's not a self-cleaning oven and you just turn it on to high 500, the highest temperature, how long does it have to be? Well, you see, the problem is is that the, if you if you ever, if, if you cook on the highest temperature ever, so then you, you have to go one degree higher. And you can't. So broil is something that you could do theoretically, or you clean the oven um, and then do it. But if you actually do clean the oven, see, well, here, let me explain yeah, what's really happening. Oven, yeah. What we're doing is, is that we're koshering your oven a number of ways. Number one, by waiting 24 hours, according to Jewish law, the food is spoiled. And, uh, and spoiled food is not food. So therefore, the, so, so that's one, one thing that we're doing. The second thing that we do is you clean it. Right? So by cleaning it, especially if you use soap or some other similar type of thing, um, that spoils food. And therefore, it's also not food. And you've also gotten rid of the food. So you've waited 24 hours, you've cleaned it with soap, right? And so now you're going to actually kosher it. And by your actually, uh, you're actually kosher, you, you can sit over here if you'd like, there's seats, whatever, whatever you'd like. So the so then what you do there to actually kosher it that's where we're turning the oven on. So the tur the idea of koshering it is that if if you cook with 500 degrees and it absorbs the 500 degrees it will 500 degrees will also allow it to release. However, by doing it a bit hotter you are taking everything out, and and then we can say for sure that it's kosher. So the so the best thing is that you put in you you clean the oven and then and you put it on broil, right? And and that's after waiting 24 hours. Okay, and then your oven is fine, and you know that's it's the same thing that you do if you want to kosher your oven during the year. If you if you for some reason have made a mistake and your oven is not kosher, you want to kosher your oven. You're doing basically the same idea. Self clean. You put on self clean. Yes. 
So then, now let's talk about um, your microwave. That's also sometimes a controversial thing. Some people do not allow the koshering of mic microwaves. Um, However, again, I was taught that you can kosher microwaves, yes? So just going back to ovens, I, last year I heard something that about the glass of the oven and you can't put hot items on it. Um, could you? Uh, pro I mean, the glass does not absorb, not ever. So, I don't know, I've never heard such a thing. But I don't know where you, how you would put hot items on it. It's like going to, you'll break you, your you door. Open, when you open, when you open. That's right, and if you put, hot, you yeah. put a pot on there with hot food, it's going to break your door. It's not made for that. But if you do it, so if someone told you it, then, then be, be careful. Don't do it. Okay? So let's talk, get to microwaves. Microwaves, as I said, is, is, has, does have some controversy. There are some people who say you can't kosher them. But the, the, I've learned, and many people will say, that you can. And the way that you do it is, again, you have to wait 24 hours after you've used it last. And then you take a cup of water. Um, you can use a plastic cup. You can use a glass. Then, then, and you, you fill it with water and you put it in the microwave and you let it go until the microwave has caused the water to boil and steam up the entire inside of the microwave. And then you take out the, uh, the glass of water and you wipe down the microwave and it is now kosher. Now that's only after two things, and I didn't say one of them. After you wait 24 hours and you clean it. You have to clean it. It has to be clean. There has to be no food in it. And it has to be as clean as you can get it to be. Then you do this process, and, and that would, then it would become not chametz and parv. Also, the same way if the maggot gets strafe? Yeah, same thing. Yes? So, Robert, you, so let's say you, so you use it, and then tonight, like, then you clean it, and then you wait 24 hours? No, the 24 hours. Uh, oh, you mean from the time of cleaning it? Yeah, you, you can. You clean it the next day after. Uh, you can clean the 24 hours would be from at the last time that you put anything hot in it. So if you clean it with very hot water, water hot enough that your hand would immediately like pull away from it, so then you'd have to start counting 24 hours after that point. If it wasn't that hot, the water is lukewarm and you could, you know, it's hot, it's going to clean, but it's not hot enough to burn you or to cause you to have a reaction by touching it. So then you, the 24 hours could start before then. Okay. And the plastic, the plate inside should cover with saran wrap? Right? right, so you have a plate inside of it. The plate is made out of glass. Although we understand that glass does not absorb, very often this is high-tech glass, it's like Pyrex. Pyrex is questionable as to what is it, it is according to Jewish law, because it's a new invention. So what people have accepted to do is to, to wrap it with saran wrap two times. It was once completely and then once again completely. Um, it, it, the saran wrap will, and remember this is not aluminum foil, it's a saran wrap. You use aluminum foil, you won't have any problems with your microwave because it won't, won't work if it hasn't blown up. But, you're, but if you put saran wrap on, basically what you're doing is by doing it twice is that, in, uh, is that if you do it once, it's sufficient for dry food. But when you put liquid in, the, li the liquid, if the liquid gets in between it, then it's as if it's not there because if you put liquid on top and then liquid in between then it's as if there's no saran wrap according to Jewish law so you want to do it two times um, once you wrap it fully and then once again it doesn't have to be wrapped and wrapped and wrapped just once fully and once again and then you can use that for the entire week just like that so your microwave becomes totally usable if you do it that way now your refrigerator does not have to be kosher for Passover it has to be cleaned that's all you don't cook in your refrigerator, um, even though some people will put hot food in the refrigerator, which is not a great idea, but they do. Um, nevertheless, you have to clean it. What you should not do is put aluminum foil on all, uh, all over the refrigerator. You will break it. There, there are, you will notice now that I tell you that your refrigerator shelves around the edges or in the center somewhere they have there's, there's spaces in it for air to circulate. If you cover all those spaces, your air will not circulate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your refrigerator will always think it's not cool enough, and it'll constantly run, and your, and ju and your refrigerator can, can break. Just like your stove, if you put inside your stove aluminum foil everywhere, and it touches the burner, it'll short, it can very well could short the burner, and you gotta call the guy, yeah, you don't wanna have to call the guy to fix your oven right before Pesach, it's not good. <laughs> So you're yes. saying with the, like what Wesley did last week, he cleaned the fridge in the basement. He uh, put uh, ammonia so no comets would get around it. So what, what, what you have to do with your refrigerator is you have to clean it. 
so that there's no chametz in it. You have to take any food that's chametz out of it, and then you have to clean the whole refrigerator. You then, the if you want to, you could. If, you, if the ammonia basically is helping you clean it because you might have crumbs that you didn't reach, the ammonia spoils it. Right? Turn, you, nobody would eat it. So if it's inedible, then it's not forbidden. So then what, what you're doing is then when you're then oh, um, taking all the food out and cleaning your refrigerator, so it's good to, to, you know, you can put things to cover areas, but you don't have to. You really don't have to, but you really should not put chametz back into your refrigerator. Um, like, don't say that, it, you know, it would be allowed literally to put, for instance, a, like, you know, a shelf at the bottom and have chametz and cover it and hide it. Thank you very much. But... And really, you shouldn't. You should have no chametz in your refrigerator, um, and just clean it all out. Make sure there's nothing in it, and then you can use it. All right. There's no need to kosher your refrigerator um, or your freezer. The same thing. Yes. So, like, what I was wondering is, like, if if you sell a dressing in the year, like, you know, um, even at the same time, can you leave it in there? Like, well, you you see, the problem is that the, the, the law about chametz is not only that you can't use it, you can't own it, and you're not supposed to see it. See that you see what you own, right? So by leaving it there, you very well could. Sure, you could put it in the bottom shelf, you could cover that shelf and make it so you don't see it, but you're just making possible problems for yourself. If you have more than one refrigerator, I'd suggest you, you wake one for, for Pesach and the other one you can put stuff in and you don't have to worry about it. And it stays in there over the week and you just you sell that refrigerator and everything in it and you leave it that way for Pesach. Yeah? Yes. What about I bought chicken too much because it was on sale, but it's Pesach and I left it in my freezer. Um, all I've done is I carefully separated it and I rewrapped it in I look, we wrapped it in the, in the yes. plastic, saran wrap, and it's back and it's frozen. Okay. There's no way I can answer the question because <laughs> the moment it entered your kitchen, now it's, it's, it's what did you do with it? Did, were you careful? Did you not have any chametz around? If you, do, if you were careful, you didn't have chametz around, you did it in a good manner so that you know that you didn't do anything wrong, so then it's fine. But if you don't know, then it becomes a question. I can tell you that if you bought, that if you had told me you had bought it, you put it in the freezer, and it, and and you didn't use it, and you bought it a while ago, it's still fine. It's still kosher for Pesach. The the kosher uh, chicken companies here, as we thought mentioned last week, are the chicken is always kosher for Pesach. That they, that they do, and certainly now it is. And therefore, if you bought it last week, two weeks ago, it's all going to be kosher for Pesach. But as soon as you open it, oh. now you got to tell me if it's kosher. I don't know. I don't know what you did. So okay. Even you with know. your description, yeah. I can't yeah. tell. So the diet I would have to either transfer it for Can I store it say at the fridge and work? Yeah, it's not chametz. You just can't eat it. You can keep it in your freezer, oh, but you can't use it. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. What's he's going to put liners in the fridge? I bought liners at Sobeys. He's going to put liners in the fridge down. Okay. He doesn't really have to, but if you want, just be careful not to cover all the vents. Otherwise, you'll get break your refrigerator. Okay, your dishwasher. Um, unless you have an industrial dishwasher, which is totally stainless steel, there's really, it really shouldn't use a dishwasher that was not for Pesach, because it's first thing, it's extremely hard to clean. The food gets into the trap at the bottom, and by the water goes in and it refills, and then the, the what's in there comes up. It's going to go everywhere. It's just uh, you either have to, really should only have a new dishwasher or a Passover dishwasher. And, and it's not again, it's not my place to tell you how to spend your money, but you can buy a dishwasher, and they're not that expensive. But it's not you know again, if you really remember, we're only talking about one week. So yeah, you can. There are other ways of doing it, but you really shouldn't. You shouldn't. Um, we may have ways to kosher your dishwasher when you buy the house in the first place, but Passover is stricter. And we really, um, really shouldn't do it. So, but if you have an industrial one, which means it's totally stainless steel inside, lots of us have them on the outside, but on the inside, then then you can kosher it as a stainless steel. But I have never met anybody with stainless steel dishwashers in their home, and the in, they were inside were totally stainless steel. So, that's the only time you could do it. Is there stainless steel in the Torah? How do they know about stainless steel? Because it's metal. <laughs> oh. That's why. A garburator. So uh, people, it's, I know it's a funny one, but people ask me about this every year. Can can you use your carburetor? So of course on Yom Tov you can't because you can't turn it on. But but uh, really what you should do, only because very often your carburetor will 
get filled with water and it'll bring up things, right? It happens all the time. Um, especially when you have uh, Shabbat and Yom Tov, right? And you can't run it, so it'll bring it up. So you really should run it, right, before Pesach. But otherwise, there's no need to do anything. You're not eating it. You're not eating from it, it right? And you have, and, and then when we get to the sink, you'll see that it really won't make a difference. So if you want to use it, first thing is before Pesach, even if you're not going to use it, you should run it. Besides the smell, but you should run it. Then on, on Pesach, right, you could have it. Some people will go so far as putting some bleach in it before they run it in order to make sure that any food particles that are left behind are destroyed. You can do it. It's, you know, bleach, ammonia, anything that is some type of caustic thing that would, that would destroy the food. You can, even soap, but it, it's not necess necessary, really. You can. All right, now, um, countertops. So, so we're, now we're going to talk about using your countertop with nothing on it and putting a hot pot right onto it. All right, that's, that's the most extreme. So in the case of having stone ones, right, that are made from different stones, they're different, they're different kinds. You can have granite, right? You can have, you have different types of uh, stones. Those are perfectly fine. You could just clean them like you would clean them normally, right? Um, you, if you want, you could you could put um, hot water on it to clean it. You should wait, tw not use it for 24 hours before Pesach, but as long as it's totally clean, stone does not absorb, and you can use it on Pesach with without a problem. Um, if you have formica, you can't use it at all. Formica is like plastic; it absorbs. We there's no way of koshering it, so you can cover it. With um, you can use like you know uh, like they have like these cupboard liners. They have um, I saw one place that had these very thin um, corrugated plastic that was it's very light and very cheap. And they, and I don't know if they still have it, but there used to be there was a guy that advertised and he would come to your house. He'd measure your counters for you, and he would cut the pieces. He'd deliver it to you, and you could just take them and you it's like this wide like after Pesach and you can store them somewhere really easily then pull them out and lay them flat on all your counters it fits perfectly and you've got you've got now something you put stuff on on your counters on Pesach um, but if you have anything better than formica something that's a natural stone those are perfectly fine to use you don't have to worry about them you just should clean them okay um, but as I said formicas you can't use yes so um well, I've never seen poured concrete, but I have seen man-made stone. I, I forgot the name for it. Coralite, something like that. Um, right, so they, they allow that. It's allowed like stone. Because what it basically is is crushed stones and then re redone. It's like bonded leather, you know, bonded leather, big leather, and they chew it up and then they make it come out very pretty. So it's like bonded, the same idea. They take the stones, they chop them up real small, and then they reformat them so that they come out uniform. So it looks nicer. Um, and that's okay. Uh, a couple of years ago, if you'd asked that question, they, they were saying it wasn't good because they weren't positive about it, but now the rabbis have looked into it and they're saying it's okay. And to cut the, if you have formica, like can you put saran wrap over it? Um, saran wrap, you can. Saran wrap is gonna is not might not last so well, um, but you could do that. You can also simply use hot plates and not put anything on the counter. And right? it's not forbidden. To, you know, you could take a, you know, a banana and pass over and put it on the counter. It's not going to hurt anything. You know, but I'm, remember, the example I'm using is hot food on the counter. You can't put anything hot on the counter. But if you put something that's not hot, you know, it's like put it, it's like taking it and putting it on your, on your dresser, right? So it's, but but what we do is we go out of our way. We do the extra mile for Passover. So we, we should cover it because we forget. And suddenly you've made this big turkey for your seder, and you pull it out, and somebody calls you, and you do one second, and you put it down on the counter. Besides the fact that you probably melt your formica, you've now made your turkey a problem. So, because of the chance that those types of things, you should try to cover it. Saran wrap will work, but you can't put anything hot on saran wrap; it'll melt. You could put aluminum foil on. They have also all the stores have these. They, they they're liners. They call them that. That you can get in rolls, and you can just put that out if you want. That's also helpful. So I don't guess so your point is that if you had a pot, let's say and it was cool, let's say it was cool, and you put it on the counter, then, that's okay. 
Yeah. Well, it's no, the, nothing really will happen in such an instance that if the pot is uh, is cold because there's no transfer. Direct food that you no, even the pot. If the pot's hot, then it'll transfer and it would become comets. Um, yeah. But in general, that's the. Uh, you see, we have to differentiate between the letter of the law, which I, for for the laws of kosher is 100% fine. And on Passover, though, we go a little bit beyond that because it's it's only a week, and we're and the the average person who is not usually strict will become more strict. So some of the laws are a bit stricter. So it's preferable to cover it, right? Uh, if you don't, the only time you're really going to have a problem is if you put something hot on it. But but don't you know, don't uh, you you can call me whenever you like, but I w always get a call with someone who did it. They put the hot food by mistake because you're so used to it that you're not going to think. I not you, but most people would not think. So just keep, keep it in mind. Yes. Quick question about uh, burn. Last year, we'll, uh, we'll get to the urns, but go okay, ahead. Okay, because last year, right before Passover, I need I needed a new urn, so I bought a new mm -hmm. urn, and all I do is just rinse it out with water. It mm -hmm. never touches anything mm -hmm. else. Do you need another urn for no. Passover, or you no. can use the same? Urn? As long as you're careful you with your urn throughout the year that you didn't. For instance, the way you clean urns, like how you clean a coffee maker, is usually done with uh, vinegar, vinegar, right? Yeah. And vinegar is comets. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't do any of that, and all you did was rinse it out and you're careful with it, you have no problem. So right? if you cleaned it with vinegar, it's comets? Yeah. <laughs> vinegar is comets. Even a long time ago? Well, you know, it's, uh -huh. you can kosher it, but it's not easy to kosher an urn. Forget it. Okay. Yeah. But, you, but it couldn't have been you did a long time ago. You just got it. No, I got it last Pesach. Yeah, and you just put water in, though. Water all the time, but I, I'm sure, I, I know, I've, I've, yeah. I've used vinegar on it. Oh, okay. So, yes. Okay. Yeah, like last, um, last year I started buying pots and pans for Passover and mixing bowls and everything, and all the stuff that went into it was Pesachic. And I don't, I don't think Wesley twil twifled it last year. Hummets never went into it. So does that... Well, toveling is a separate set of laws from kosher and from kosher for Passover. Based on, um, only going on what you said, there would be kosher for Passover. The laws of toveling apply, and we can talk about that, but it's not pertinent to this right now. Right, they have a different section. Yes. I'm still, I've missed the stove top because right. of your water, so I'm going to lie. Okay. So this, my son, actually, for kosher, and, he will always use, like we have the ceramic one, the glass one. He always makes sure that the pot is on a bigger um, right. element. Okay. And so for Passover, what's the deal? Is there well, that's good? that's what we said. That you should, you can coach. Okay. You can go over it. Yeah. Oh, see, I'm glad I dropped you off early. I'm glad the boss is finally here. Keep him in line, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the boss? <laughs> She's the boss. All right. Let's go on then. Uh, sinks. So there's primarily two types of sinks as far as Jewish law is concerned. There are the stainless steel sinks and the ceramic sinks. Ceramic sinks will usually be white. Well, not always, but usually. Stainless steel is stainless steel. Today, most sinks are stainless steel. Stainless steel sinks are very easy to coach for Passover. You clean them. Again, you make sure that you haven't put hot food into it for 24 hours. You can use them, but just no hot comets into it for 24 hours. And you clean it, like as if you're, you want to make it nice and clean. And then you take boiling water from a teapot that's, I really, that's boiling, and you pour it in a, in, a, in a steady stream all over the sink, right, and, 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 it, and it's kosher, and it's fine. What about a steamer? Can you use one of those steamers you, and steam it and put it around it? And well, will, it, will, will water be coming out of it or just steam? Uh, well, water, steam is water. Yes, but it's much less water. Okay. So, no, you need to have a constant stream of water. Okay. Right, and constant is important because when water starts dripping, it gets cooler. Right. Part of it is that it's got to be a constant stream. So you're pouring it constantly, and you may run out, you refill it, and do the other part, right? Do one part of the sink after another. So you can kosher your sink that way. When um, you have a ceramic sink, you can't kosher. What people will do in those cases, and they may do anyways, is to buy Tupperware um, bins, and you stick them into your sink, and you can use them. If you want to be real clever with it, you can put a hole in the bottom, and the water will drain out. You don't have to take them out and pour it out. Um, but those are fine. Those are, if you have a, those are, are one of the best safeguards against problems with your garburator or your disposal, whatever you call it, because as I said, 
where you have, you know, when you have a lot of company, for instance, on, on Shabbos, right, uh, very often it'll, your sink will get full of water and the garburetor will start bringing up whatever little bits are in there are going to come out. You're going to see it, right? So, so when it's from before Pesach and it's, now it's Pesach, you have a problem. It's coming through the pipes. And now it's going into your sink and getting to your food. So the people who use the Tupperware bins are the safest because it never has access to, the, to it because the bin is sitting there. Um, that's why if you have a stainless steel sink and it's perfectly fine and you can kosher it, you make sure you clean out your garburetor um, and that you run it for a while and even put something in it, some caustic, something that will cause the food to be spoiled, that anything that might be in it. And then you can forget about it. Yeah. Okay. So those are the two things of the sinks. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a new product that came with the countertop. It's a stone, and then they came the. Oh, so it will be kosher. You will kosher right. But a stone sink. The the sink come with the with the. Counter. It's built in. Yeah. The like same material. The same, so yeah, yeah. it'll be fine. But it's even really better than stainless steel yeah. because it's never unkosher. Okay, so now now we're going to get into the, the meat of things, the pots and pans, the dishes and silverware, okay? The easiest way to understand this is it's very easy to kosher metal. So if you have metal pots and pans, 100% metal, nothing else on it but metal, very simple. You just have to, you, all you have to do with, a pot, with pots and pans is if you have a, one very large pot, you fill that pot up. If, it, if you have a very large kosher for Passover um, pot, and you fill it up with water on your kosher for Passover stove. And then you take your non-kosher for Passover pots that are 100% metal. You drop them in after the water is boiling inside of that pot. It's kosher. It's finished as soon as you drop it in. The same thing with silverware, metal. metal. You just drop it in, and it's kosher. But most of us have, have pots and things that have handles that are not metal, mm -hmm. unless you're a professional. Professionals will have all metal. Right? If you go to a you know, to someone who's a trained chef or someone like that, you're going to find it's all metal. It's easier to clean. That's why they do it, and they retain the heat in, in a very constant way. But uh, most of us have handles. So now it becomes a little trickier. Um, so we'll do that in order. All right. Now that's that. Number one is metal. Number two is somewhat metal. That means it's metal, but it has something that's not metal on it. So in, in such a case, it's harder to kosher. If you have, if you can take the the handle off it, very often they unscrew. You'd have to clean everywhere. You'll notice how much how dirty it really is when you take the handle off. Um, you then clean it, you can kosher the metal, and then you can put back on the handle. You're not going to cook with the handle, so it won't be a problem. But uh, if you can't take the handle off, it now presents an issue that you really can't kosher that pot because of the handle. So very, like, mo most of the time, like in my house, we have pots that have these black, like sort of like plastic handles, but they're, they're gripping a metal handle underneath it. And then you can just uh, like either loosen a screw or pull and they come off and you can kosher the pot and then put it back on. But just make sure you clean it. Yes? I mean, do you have to put the handle in too? I mean, like, like most of the time, you can't do both. Or you because it's too big? Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, you should you do, the, you, you should, it and turn around and stick the handle in. well, you can do that, you can do that, um, but I'll advise you that I have a, a note on here, that uh, if you go on April 2nd over to the buy it in the parking lot, the C, it's not the buy it doing this, the COR is coming and as a community service, they, they have a pot bigger than you'd imagine anybody has. Huh. And you can go over there and, and bring anything you want and they will put it in and take it out for you in a second and it's all kosher. So you can bring all of your stuff if you want and just one after another do it or you can bring one thing. Now if you have a problem or a question, a question on a specific one, they can fix it for you right on the spot. And, and, and if you have something that's questionable and you can't describe it to me, you can just show it to them. So that's if you go on April 2nd from 6 to 9 at night, you just go there and do it. And there, there's no set fee. Maybe they'll have a donation box out or something, but it's a very good way of accomplishing it. And th they do this, by the way, in, in, in Jerusalem. They've been doing it for, for many, many, many decades. It's just a very good way to do it uh, because the wa they make the water very, very hot. They have a giant pot. You know, they'll, they drop it in. They have tongs. They pull it out. It cools down, they give it back to you, and you're on your way with all your stuff kosher in the back of your car in 10 minutes, okay? Um, so, 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 the, so now you have Corningware py and Pyrex. Corningware and Pyrex, Pyrex are really uncertain what, what they are considered in Jewish law. If they're considered ceramic, then you can't kosher them. If they're considered glass, 
then it's not a problem. So, so Jewish law says that we're not that it's too much like ceramic. Like if you go to Corning and you speak with them, they'll they'll explain how the process is. And therefore, both of those things cannot be kosher for Passover. If you have kosher ones for Passover, then they're kosher for Passover. But you can't make take one that you use every, all the time to make blintzes or something, and then switch it over and for Passover. Those you can't do. Tupperware and plastic. Tupperware is plastic. You can't kosher plastic, um, and therefore you really shouldn't use any of your Tupperware or your plastic things on Passover for one week. You should stay away from them. Even though you might not use anything cold, you might only use cold in it, really you should limit it. Um, unless it's something that you bought for Passover, then it's fine, not an issue. But if you make it unkosher, there's nothing you can do to fix it. Yes? So pirates okay. also cannot be Correct. kosher. And then we get to dishes and silverware. So there's uh, so there's what I call ceramic dishes and then fine china. They're really both the same thing. They're both made from clay. This fine china is finer right? and it could have other things in it. But the difference is really not in the substance. According to Jewish law, we cannot kosher ceramic. However, there in the case of fine china. That is something that's an heirloom, you know, like, you know, the $100 is a set, $200, $500 a set, Rosenblum, Versace china. I, um, the rabbis, you know, understand that we're not looking to make people poor who make a mistake on this kind of thing, or their mother had this very expensive china, and you got it, and your mother wasn't so strict, or your grandmother wasn't so strict, and now what do you do? So, there are many things that can be done, but in general, um, if you have fi- if you have ceramic dishes, like you go to Sears and buy them for fifty dollars, there's nothing you can do. Uh, they, you can't kosher them. If they're not kosher, you can't for Passover. You can't make them kosher for Passover. If they're new, you can use them, but you can't switch them. Right? And if you make one unkosher and by mistake, there's nothing you can do to fix it. When it comes to fine china, to the letter of the law, it replies the same. However, because of the uh, the worth or the meaning behind it to you for these things. So then, in that case, you can kosher them. However, you have to do it. It takes a year. And it's not a year in boiling water, though. <laughs> you, you have to, the, the, the law is that you have to let them sit unused for a year, and then um, you can clean them and, and you can use them. That's only with fine, specifically fine china. Really, in every case, it's probably best to ask. Right? You can call me or another rabbi and ask about it. It is a lenient opinion, but it is a very common lenient opinion. Um, so, so if you have that, like, you know, I know people will tell me all the time, my grandmother had fine china that she used for Passover, but I don't think she was so strict. What do I do? So I'll say, well, when did you use it last? Well, it's been 20 years. Yeah. So I tell them, okay, you can wash it off. It'll be fine. Right? But if they say that, you know, I have, I have it, I want to use my special party, you know, China on Pesach, even though I use it all year, you can't, there's nothing, you can't do it. I can't kosher it. Yes. And within that opinion, you can use it with hot? Yeah, you can just use it. It's yeah. finished. It's new. Okay. Um, silver, stainless, or metal eating, or, or utensils for eating. I wrote it funny. Silverware is metal. You can... While it's you know while you, it's always good to have silverware for Passover, but if you don't, you simply can take your silverware, make sure it's clean, which I would presume it probably is, and just drop it in the pot that we talked about with the boiling water. As soon as you drop it in, they're kosher. Basically, you're not going to go fishing for it, so you wait till it cools down and you can take it out. But your silverware, um, silverware is simple. Stainless steel is right. Stainless items like that is also um, any type of eating utensils that are made 100% out of metal is no problem. You can kosher them just as I described without, without a second thought. It's very simple. Um, utensils with wooden handles have the same problem as pots with wooden handles. If you can take off the wooden handle, you'll see how dirty it is. You'll have to really clean it. You can kosher that part. You could reattach the, uh, the handle. You should make sure, of course, that the handle is not used for the for used in the food. Right? Like if you have a ladle, Right? You're not going to use the handle to serve soup. You're going to use the other end. But if you happen to have one that I haven't thought of, some type of an object that I haven't thought of, and it has a wood on it, or plastic, or rubber, or some other substance other than metal, it's, you, you need to somehow get rid of it in order to kosher it. And if you can't, then you can't use it. What about the candle? Like you have silver candlesticks. You don't need those. That's okay. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. He has a habit. To use them. <laughs> he has a habit of cleaning his teeth with them. 
So, um, in, in the laws of kosher, it's very simple. But in the laws of Pesach, what you do with glasses, which is, which is the next thing, glasses and crystal, and the same thing would apply to glass dishes, is that you are supposed to soak them in a tub of water for three days. Each day you take you change the water. Okay, so you 24 hours change the water, 24 hours change the water, 24 hours finished. Okay, by doing that is perfectly fine. When you're talking about the laws of kosher, it's just a matter of waiting 24 hours and they're fine. It's a different. The laws of kosher, right? They have, there's an additional stringency put into koshering it by doing it that way. Because really, according to the letter of the law, glass does not absorb. So therefore, if you would if you would use glass for, let's say, you'd make uh, oatmeal and you put it in there, there is no oatmeal in the glass. So therefore, if you wait 24 hours just to make sure that there's no oatmeal on the glass, then it's finished. But uh, for Passover, they have the extra stringency of adding to it that there is a um, that, that they soak it because anything that's on it will be destroyed by okay. soaking it. So you don't have to soak it with soap. It doesn't have to be hot water. You just soak it. Like uh, when I was a kid, my mother used to fill our bathtub. And she used to fill it with glass stuff. Wow. And I told you, we koshered everything in our house. She filled it with glass. Can you imagine how many people we must have had in our house? There's just so much glass. She filled yeah. up the whole bathtub. <laughs> Every day we'd come in, we'd empty the bathtub, empty all the glasses, fill the bathtub up again. Like it was part of the party. Yeah. Right? So that's what, what they did. Really? Lovely question. Yes. Um, what about utensils? Um, plastic utensils? Like disposable? But right. They, that you could use more than one, so say three, four times. Those don't have to be toggled. I know you're not talking about toggling, but well, it was a question. The, the, brand uh, new the idea is that if, that if that plastic silverware is the purpose of plastic silverware is to be is really to be used once. By the virtue of the fact that you're going to use it more than once, you're now saying that it's permanent silverware. So you should. So toggle then you'd have to toggle. Okay. okay. If it happened, you'd be okay. If it happened, like let's say you were going to use it once and you ran out, you use one twice, it, that would be okay. But if it was your intention to use it more than once, you'd have to do it. Toggle by definition is to put in a mikvah. But that's oh. something you can There's a separate law from kosher. It's a it's an important law, but it's separate from kosher. If we have time, I can explain it. But it's a different right. class. So I have a bizarre question. Somebody comes over. You have a Passover dinner. Some of your family isn't even kosher as a person, and they touch your plates. So. So. People are kosher. <laughs> really? <laughs> Not only that, but they're parv. <laughs> yeah. So don't eat people. And, and, and even, even uh, and how do we know? Because a mother's milk actually is parv. Don't do it. Okay? <laughs> don't do it. Don't let him do it. All right. I ain't touching that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now specialty items. Wait, wait, yes. No, no, because it, it's just soaking it. Well, it's not using hot water even. You don't need to. Right. Now, specialty items: coffee makers. Right? If you have a coffee maker, so the issues with the coffee maker are as follows. Number one is if you clean the coffee maker. The, whatever it is you use to clean it, if it was from the company it was that they sell you or you did it yourself by reading it, they have vinegar in it. Now, some vinegar is uh, usable for Pesach, but in general, vinegar is not kosher for Pesach. So therefore, it would, then, it would make your coffee maker unkosher. The second problem would be just simply because uh, our coffee maker is right next to our toaster, right? Even though I'm sure that none of us want to put crumbs into our coffee maker, it's going to happen. So um, the, that's the ne next issue. The third is what you put in it. Co um, you know, regular coffee is not really an issue. Right? It's, it, it's, there's no comments in coffee, as long as you know that that's what you did, and you, you watched it, that the coffee in your house, that you, there was no chametz got into it in your house, because when it comes into your house, there's no chametz in it. But now it's in your house, and it's open, I can't tell you what you do. So if you're not careful, you could have chametz in it. Whatever it is, because we're not thinking about Pesach on uh, November 15th, and you're making a cup of coffee, and then you're, you know, you're, you're, you're using it in such a way, you really shouldn't use your coffee makers over Pesach for that reason, for all of those reasons. And and if you really want a coffee maker, it's nothing wrong with that. We have one for Pesach. You know, you can get them as cheap as $15. One of the best, just as a point of advice, if you enjoy coffee and you're addicted to coffee and you want to have coffee for Pesach, you realize that Pesach, <coughs> it's basically seven days. It's basically a week of which 
four or five of those days are holidays, which means that under normal circumstances for those people who observe the holidays and Shabbos, you can't really turn on the coffee maker. So the, a very good idea is to get a French press or a Bodum is the brand name, which is basically a, a pl- it's like a, a coffee holder and you put the coffee in and hot water and you, you let it cook and then you push the thing down and it pushes the grounds to the bottom. So you can use that on Yom Tov. You can use that on the holiday. So if you buy one of those in the store, you can have coffee on Pesach, and you're just not going to have drip coffee. You'll have a different kind of coffee. It's, it's actually superior, I think, but you can but get you what like you want. Not on Shabbos, right? Yeah. What? Not on Shabbos. No, not on Shabbos, but on, on Yom Tov you can do it. That is not Shabbos and Yom Tov. You, have, you plug in your urn filled with hot water, and right. when you get hot before Shabbos, can you, you technically still... No, because you're cooking the coffee. No, no, not the coffee. The no, you've got an urn. Right. You know those big urns? Right. And, you, and you're making coffee in the urn? No. Or just hot water? Just, just, to, just to keep the water hot. Right. Because how you can use the hot water to get to the bottom. Well, you can't on Shabbos because you're cooking the coffee. Right? When oh, you put I that. See. Okay, but I know. Yeah. I understand. Right? On Yom Tov, you're allowed to cook. So you can do that on a holiday. So, like this year, Passover, the first day is Shabbos, second day is not. The first day you couldn't, the second day you can. So can I still serve tea and tea bags? Like so that's, um, on Yom Tov you definitely can. On, on Shabbos there are two opinions. There are those who say it's perfectly okay to use tea bags. Others say you should use a tea essence. Because it because by definition it certainly seems like you're cooking the tea. But what you do is you, add, I don't want to go too long because it's really right. a different thing, but it's, it's what's called, you use water that has three times away from the original heat source. So you take a cup, the water comes out of your urn, so that's when now you have you have, you have now the urn is one. This is now the second one. You take that, pour it into a third cup, mm-hmm. right? Then you take that and put that into your coffee. Right? Tea. You make your coffee because tea. that on shot or tea, put it into your tea bag. Then it becomes totally fine according to. to but it's to the cold tea. at that point. No, it's not. It's hot. It's just not hot enough that Jewish law says that it's cooking. Oh, well, so you don't worry. It can be quite hot. So you're saying if you do that, you can use the bottle. No, no, you can use the tea bags. That was her question, was tea bags. That's according to the more stringent opinion. The more lenient opinion allows you to use tea bags on Shabbos in any case with the third level. Some don't. Yes? If you somehow got chametz on the outside of your hot water maker... Then it's chametz. The whole, the whole yeah, because it's hot. The outside gets hot? Yeah. Touch it, you'll see. <laughs> okay? So... Um, the so call, no, hot plates and warmers, which are really the same thing. So, you know, if you use it during the year, it's very hard to clean it totally so that you can use it on Pesach. It's just hard. I mean, it's warm. You're going to have food sitting on it on Shabbos, like for 24 hours or for 15 hours, and that whatever food's on there is going to get really ingrained into it and stained. Mm-hmm. If you can clean it then you can use it because it's not because uh, uh, by definition a hot plate is not does not cook so it's not hot enough that it'll cook the food but it's um, but it is warm if it's a warmer but you have to make sure that it's totally totally clean I would suggest that if it if it is you might even want to cover it with aluminum foil that you could cover aluminum foil it won't harm it it shouldn't harm it um, uh, especially if you leave um, some openings on the sides where the, the heat can be uh, diffused um, but but basically that's how the hot, what, hot plates work. A hot water urn, as long as you've had a reasonable caution with the hot water urn during the year, you didn't you know you 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 didn't wash it with vinegar. You just basically every week you know as most people do they just rinse it out, put it away. You can use it on Pesach. Right? You don't need to buy a special one for Pesach. You can. In my house we have one. What. What, uh, you know, uh, for some some reason we came up with two one time, so we put one away for Pesach. But you. you don't have to. You can you can use that. Um, a blech, a blech. Okay, so for those who don't know, is a piece of sheet metal usually that's put on top of a stove, that and um, not a flat ceramic top, but on a, the old the more old fashioned ones, and it diffuses the heat. And it's used on Shabbos as a way so you can put food on there to keep it warm on Shabbos. Because you're not allowed to put food on onto a onto a, a burner on Shabbos. It has to be on this one of the this thing called a blech. Because it diffuses the heat evenly and it's lower. Um, that you can't use 
for, for uh, Pesach, you have to buy a special one if you're going to use one at all. You don't have to use it. You only need it if you're going to have stuff sitting on your on your um, stove for Shabbos. It's going to be sitting on top of the stove on Shabbos, and it's on, so then you'd have to have one. If you don't, like in my house, we very rarely use it. We use the oven. Everything's in the oven. We don't, and we just leave it there until we need it. Yes, Jeff? On my stove, I have, I guess we call it a, a metal star uh, 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 so that you can put the kettle or the pot on top of the stove, but if there's a space between to separate it. Can, can that be Passover or if you clean it? If it's metal, you can kosher it for Passover by putting it into a pot with hot water. If you can't take it off the stove, then you could kosher it with, hot, with boiling hot water, mm -hmm. like we described earlier same way okay um, a high chair don't mess with high chairs like, yeah, just don't do it you yeah, it is definitely possible to kosher your kids high chairs for Passover but you basically have to take the whole thing apart screw by screw because you can be pretty darn sure that wherever you don't look there's going to be cookies right because the kids kids what because it's pure metal you still, you got the kids. Can you just dump it in hot water? The whole thing. Yeah, you can. You can drop it in hot water. Would it fit in the? Could you bring it to the? Buy it and they're gonna. They're gonna. They're not gonna do it for you. know. You're gonna cook. You take put your car in. They're not gonna do it. So yeah, okay. The high understand. The high chair is. It is definitely possible, but it's just not worth it. The 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 you know the stuff that's on the high chairs in places that you don't usually look. It's just put it away for pay. If you have to have a high chair, then you're going to have to buy one. Or you're going to have to borrow one. But really, it's like, especially even the trays that they have on them, it's just it's just not awesome. easy to do. It's just impossible. It's it's very 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 difficult. And it's like it's like when somebody comes and asks me if they can kosher their barbecue for Pesach. It's the same thing. You can, but the amount of effort you have to put into it, it's it's Herculean. It's like almost impossible. It's so difficult because you have to clean that thing like it's new, right? And, and, and how you going to do that? Like no, no one is barbecues like that. You just can't do it. So, so high chairs versus booster seats. Well, because a booster seat is a little different in that he's just sitting in it. It's like a chair. He's not eating on it. He's eating at the table. But a, a high chair they're eating on, right? Um, and that will apply in the next section with toys, right? Toys where the kids have toys. You can be sure there is going to be chametz there. So if you want to use toy, the certain toys for Shav, for Pesach, you've got to check them. You have to go and look to make sure there's no chametz. If you have a toy box, you got to empty the toy, bo toy box out. Cause, and I will promise you, you'll find something. Yeah. You're probably either going to find a Hanukkah candy or you're going to find a, a hamantashen. Or if you're really unlucky, you'll find something from Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> but you'll find something. Because it's, it's a, that's the nature of children. That's why we chat, you, you, we go through our furniture. You look under the pillows of the furniture. You're going to find stuff. Maybe you'll find some money, too. It makes a couple dollars. But you're also going to get stuck. Right? You're going to find things. Kids. Kids put things places, and Pesach we look for it. We got to get rid of it. Wait a minute. So, so toys, even though the kid doesn't eat on the toy, you have to do this. What kid doesn't eat on a toy? Kids eat everywhere. They put everything in their mouth. Well, not. They, they eat everywhere. They carry oh. food everywhere. Their yeah. faces are dirty. It's going. Well, you're going to the sofa. Fight. You got to look at the sofa yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. And 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 if you look in your sofas in your house, you have kids in the house. Not My son, right. your son. All right. So, well, if you have kids in the house and you don't and you check it and you don't find something. You win a bet. Right? I mean, it's, I never, I nobody. I, I bet I, you'll still find stuff. I have a lot of stuff already. All right, it's the same thing with books. Oh, if you have it. books, like I, I get up like on Shabbos every morning early and I learn. On Shabbos, I get up early and learn. And on Shabbos, I'll have a snack. I'm not careful with my books. I, some people are. I'm not. So if I'm going to use books on Pesach, I, ch I, I, I you know, open them and make sure that there's nothing in it. And sometimes you find. So you'd be careful. Well, a couple of one, uh, funny things that people find, or even a funny question. Um, there's a, a kittel. The kittel we wear a white robe on, on, on Passover night. So people ask me the question once: What have you like? Do you have to check your kittel? Right. Why? Why? Because they, the guy, they told me a story once that a guy had yeah. wore his kitzel for Yom Kippur. And you only wear it Yom Kippur and Passover. At the end of Yom Kippur, of course, you're hungry. So you're still wearing it. You grab something to eat, right? And then you put it in your pocket. So here's why it's not a true story. Kittles don't have pockets. Uh -huh. Kittles are for dead people. That's why they're made, right? They're, they're burial gowns. We wear them at certain times, but they don't have pockets. So it's not a true story. Okay. So yeah, if you if you have pockets in your kittle, you should check them. But I don't think you're going to find
find it. That's one. The second thing is that people have asked, and they asked. I remember asking my my teacher in yeshiva. People asked him, "What do you do about braces?" You have metal on your teeth, right? Are they chametz? So he used to say that, yes, you have to stick your head in a boiling water. <laughs> and it'll kosher your braces. And the answer is you do have, there are rules about it. If you have braces, you should um, not eat chametz for 24 hours before. And then you should, you should rinse your mouth out. With, with warm water because you're not going to be able to kosher your braces. Right? It doesn't happen. But you also don't put water, uh, food in your mouth that's so hot that it would actually affect it, right? Like you're cooking. You're not going to, you're not, you'd burn yourself. So you just do something as sort of a sign of it. And by not eating in 24 hours after you've cleaned your teeth, so then uh, then you're not going to have any comments in your mouth. Right? Now, and it doesn't mean any comments. It means hot. You shouldn't have hot comments. If you have, because you have to eat, but we're Pesach, so you can eat. Yes? Um, so uh, Haggadah is that you're going to have at the table that maybe at some point had uh, comments on them, maybe you're studying or whatever with them before. So it's like so any just, other book then. Just like shake it out, yeah. and then it can come to the table? Yeah, right. You know, if, if you are any book, in my case, any books that I have that I use to study with that I may have, have brought to the table, I won't bring to the table at Pesach. 